What's up, everybody? Let me know if that fan, I got a fan going on in here. It's super hot. Let me turn it, let me turn it down. Maybe that'd be a little bit better. Maybe that'd be better. Oh, hopefully everybody is doing great today. I'm just gonna give it a couple of minutes again. Oh. We're back at it. We're back at it. Today is going to be a, an interesting conversation to say the least. We're going over mental preparation, you know, how to deal with anxiety, all that, all that stuff that goes into being an athlete off the mats, off the mats now. That's the conversation for today. Oh, I guess we're not going to get into like strength and conditioning. We're going to focus more on like the, the brain side of things, your thoughts dealing with things, getting over things, overcoming things, all that kind of stuff is what we're talking about today. Just going to give it a few minutes. What's up, the hero? Oh. Let me know if that fan is too much, guys. I don't know if it's because it's kind of like blowing straight into the microphone here, but I turned it down. Hopefully it's not too much of a hiss. It's freakishly hot in here. Since the dojo is closed, that means the AC is off to save money. <laughs> Which means I'm suffering in here. Just going to give it a few minutes to let some people jump on in here before we get started. I'm super excited. I finally got my Yeti mug back into my office. I accidentally left it outside on the deck and then it got rained on and then I was just too lazy to go out there and get it. But I have it back, which means my coffee is now warm. This right here is probably the best office investment I ever made. Right, apart from the Keurig that you can see over my over my shoulder here. This is like gold to me. I love it. It fits my fingers. It's hard for me to find a mug that fits my my meat hooks for fingers, but I absolutely love it. But if you guys want to take a minute and think about any questions or things you're struggling with that you want to overcome. Um, I'll do a little bit of like storytelling on, you know, some things that used to work for me, some things that haven't worked for me, um, some struggles that I ran into, but then how I overcame them, how I did certain things, uh, just to give you guys a little bit of backstory about me and my career and what I, what I had to go through, what I had to overcome and how I did it. And then you guys can drop some questions in the comments section here and I'll try to get to them. What's up, Sasaki? Also, while I have everybody here before we get talking about this, some of you guys, when I'd asked you about topics to come up with, some of you guys came up with some interesting topics and I like it. I like it a lot. Two of them that are 100% going on the docket. Two of them, whoops. Wrong button, this button. Let me see here, let's go over here. Yeah, two of them is gonna be, um, the first one is we've been kind of ranting on and off about um, problems in the American judo system and, and everything else. So I think a good topic to kind of wrap it all up, like rant number three, we're just, what would what would I do, right? Here's the question: Like, what would I do? Like, what would be my action plan, and why, um, in order to improve judo in America and try to get it to be a little bit more mainstream? Um, try to develop a few more champions. Try to ensure that the Olympic team was solid and strong and medal contenders. You know, make sure our juniors were winning uh, world medals at the junior stage and the cadet stage. Like. How would I go about making sure that I could, I could tackle this problem head on and, 
and how would I do it? I want to I want to have a live conversation. I think I'm going to readjust the office here so that we can have a good whiteboard going on so I can put some notes on it and, you know, give a little diagram with my ugly handwriting and all my misspellings. But I think it would be an interesting interesting conversation to say the least. Um the other the other topic was um again this whole judo in college thing. You know, I I feel like we should have a private conversation about that or, or like a separate conversation about why cuz I get it. I I understand everybody's thing with you know wanting to put um judo into colleges and they look at wrestling and they look at swimming and they look at all these other things as to why it works and oh I feel like that should be another conversation. But if you guys have any other topics, man, just send them my way. Send them my way. Drop them in the comments here. Not now, though. But once it goes live, drop them in the comments. And then I'll see it. I'll take some notes. Get a little timeline going of topics to talk about. And we'll go from there. Right? What's up, Travis? My beard is big on the mindset game for competition and training. So I'm excited to hear your approach coming from such a high level. Smooth sailing never made for a good marine. Uh, let's see here. Can I? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Six. No, hey. Work. Boom. Add. So here we go. We got a we got a mini countdown timer. We are gonna do our best from here on out to keep this down to an hour. We're gonna we're gonna to try to hit that time slot. So I'm just gonna put a little reminder here just so I can see it on where this conversation is gonna go. So this conversation is about mental preparation for events, right? Like how do you how do you deal with anxiety? How do you deal with preparing for events? And I want to I want to start in the middle, and then just to give that anxiety and nervousness um put that to rest on how you can handle that and then we'll go back to how to make sure that you can do that when you step onto the mat okay i'll catch you later hero let me know what you think in the comments when you come back and watch it so for me one of the big questions that people are always asking here in chat is how do you deal with anxiety and the nerves of competing? Um, step number one to that is you have to compete. There is no rule or thing that you can do to make sure that you are not nervous competing if you have never done it. Right? There's there's a slogan for the life of me. I can't think of it um, right now, but it's... It's got something to do about being the first time. No matter what you do for the first time, you're going to be super nervous. And the idea is, is if you looked at it on a sliding scale, like zero to a hundred, where a hundred is, you're basically vomiting in the bathroom. You're so nervous, right? Everybody when they, to zero being like, you're completely relaxed. Um, everybody falls on that spectrum somewhere. Okay, and basically what you're looking for is if you find out where you're falling on that spectrum and then figure out where the balance is that you need to be at to perform optimally. Because for me, no athlete performs optimally in any competition being at zero. Okay, usually, usually we find people that sit at zero um, are the ones that aren't really invested and they don't necessarily care about the outcome or the performance. Um, they're just there because they have to be. They're there because their friend is there. They're there because 
it's just this thing that their parents are making them do or they're peer pressured into doing. Um, then you have the people on the other side of the spectrum where it is they ju they're just so afraid of getting embarrassed. They're afraid of failure. They're afraid people are going to make fun of them. What if I get choked? What if I get arm locked? What if I get thrown? And they, f they have this fear that they're going to be embarrassed. Um, and that tends to lead to most of the anxiety. And when you figure out where you fall on that scale, you'll know how to make adjustments. But I think for the sake of this conversation, we're going to focus on the embarrassment side of it, that fear where like you're overly anxious to the point where it's hard to function. Um, usually what that means is you can perform very well. We call them dojo warriors or dojo champions where they perform super well in the dojo because there's no pressure, everything is relaxed and that everything just works for them. But then they step into competition, anxiety sets in and fear sets in and they question and they doubt and they can't process the information that's coming their way. And that tends that tends to be the situation I feel like most people are in who are actually going to compete, right? Um, my number one, my number one thing for people who are in that boat is to just compete. If you are overly anxious and overly nervous, right? You just, the act of competition is a win. And you need to take that into consideration, right? If you're just starting out and you're nervous, the act of doing it makes you a champion, right? You are you are taking this fear and this thing you were doing and you are going, I'm, I'm challenging it. I'm gonna challenge myself. I'm gonna run through this obstacle and here we go. And that in and of itself is where true power resides. The ability to have a fear but then make the choice to overcome it, okay? And the more you compete, the more it'll alleviate that fear. And what happens to a lot of people is they make a transition from this fear of competing to a fear of failure because that's usually how it goes down the system. If you're at 100%, you have a fear of competing. If you're at like an 80, a 90, you have a fear of failure or a, a fear of being embarrassed. And then when you fall into like the 70s and 60s ranges, you have a fear of letting people down, right? And it kind of goes through this system. And your job as an athlete is to always make improvements where you can find the balance, where you're a little bit nervous, but it's a good nervous, right? It means you're firing on all cylinders. And then once you get past the idea of competing, and you start to fall into this embarrassed stage, right? You have to you have to understand and you have to put it into perspective. Okay, everybody starts somewhere on the scale. So if you're starting at like an 80 and then you fall to a 60, but somebody starts at a hundred and then is at a 60, they're actually progressing better. They are becoming a better athlete and they're becoming a better sportsman, as the Europeans would put it. And that's and that's really um what it's about is making sure that you are always seeking that improvement and not and not determining the outcome of the day. Pay attention to where you started, where you are going and where you fall onto that. Okay, because that's what you should be looking at when you're looking at improvement. A lot of people get caught up in the day to day activity. Um, and I, I'm a victim of it. Right, I, I'm a hundred percent a victim of looking at my day and then feeling ashamed, feeling embarrassed, um, wanting to lock myself in my room. Having locked myself in my room, I remember um, in London, I was one hundred percent embarrassed. I was ashamed. I felt like I not only let my coaches down, I let my country down, and the fact that my match, my semifinal match had been played on national television and I lost like wrap your head around that I lost on national television it's not like I can hide behind the team it's not a team sport it's not like 
I'm a good linebacker, but the running back dropped the ball and we lost. It's like, I, me, Travis Stevens, lost. And it's like, not only did I lose, but I was crying, I was a wreck, and then I lost the bronze, and that was televised. And basically, all the all the U.S. ever saw of me the day of the Olympics was losing. And I had locked myself in my room at the Olympics in London, and I just, I left my room to get McDonald's. And then I came back to my room and my floor was covered in McDonald's. Like I remember my teammates just trying to get me out of my room to go do stuff. And I was a miserable wreck. So I get it. I get the embarrassed stage. Been there. Done it. Got to overcome it. Okay. And um, here's how I overcome that embarrassed stage. Right. When I was dealing with London and I remember it lasted for months. I just... Every time an athlete looked at me, I just felt like they were laughing at me, right? Like I just like, oh, you just like, it's like when you don't meddle on the IJF stage and then you got to go to the cafeteria and it's like everybody's looking at you and you feel like a failure, right? But, but, right, think about it like this, right? As an athlete on the international stage, uh, when you don't meddle, like let's say you go one and done, one and done, for example, um, and you're sitting there. But let's say you've had some success, right? Like I, I myself was, a, in my opinion, I was a successful judo player, right? But there were times, right? There were times where, you know, I went out to compete and, you know, I went one and one. I went 0 and one, right? The world championships is a great example because I was supposed to be this like Newaza guru, never lose on the ground, right? Like I'm on my way up, like, I'm like fifth or sixth in the world at the time and I'm fighting the German in the second round and I get choked and I lose and I'm out. I'm out of the world championships the year before the Olympic Games. And not only did I lose, but I got choked for the, for like one of the first times on the world stage. I was, it might actually be the first time I was legitimately choked and I had to tap. And like, I remember just this feeling of like, what am I doing with my life? And, but the, the trick is, is when I was in London, I was embarrassed and ashamed. In 2015, I could still walk around with my head held high in front of everybody and not be worried, right? Because I came to the realization that even when you go one and done, when you look at the, look at everything as a whole, right? And um, I'm sitting in the cafeteria and let's say one of my players comes in and he went he went one and done as well i have never never in my life ever looked at anybody like let's say anybody in like the top 20 for example just for a round number right somebody who has meddled on the ijf stage i've never looked at anybody that's gone one and done and been like yeah you know what they're a real piece of shit you know they suck like that doesn't happen like you don't as a human being like you're not like making fun of the person inside your own head because of how they lost okay nine times out of ten when you're actually in the tournament and you're competing you don't know what's happening on the other side of the bracket you're not really sure you don't really remember you're so focused on you and your own performance and who you have to fight that it's more about like hey so what happened with so and so oh so and so beat so and so with so and so and it's like they're just like these fading memories and like yeah people might talk about it for that blip of a second but that's it right like nobody looks at it and they just start pointing the finger and laughing even in their hoax i've never done it and i don't feel like anybody's ever done it to me when you come to that idea where people aren't really paying attention to you right i've always had this thing since london where like you know what Nobody really cares about you, right? The people that love you, win or lose, will still love you. And the people that hate you, will still hate you, right? Whether you win or whether you lose doesn't change that fact, right? You're not going to all of a sudden lose and then the people that actually cared about you are going to change sides and now they're going to hate you. That's not how it works. But in our brains, we, we 
individually, we put this like obscure pressure, like when we feel ashamed, that we feel like people are looking at us um, in this way where it's like you're feeling judged, but it's internally you, it's just you. And when I was trying to get past this in London, I, I was like, I was on the circuit and like I was embarrassed to just be around people right i was supposed to win the olympic games i wasn't supposed to lose not only once but twice not even medal like that that just was not supposed to happen in my head and i felt like the world was like laughing at me for doing it cuz not only did i lose but i was falling over i was crying i couldn't stand up i lost again like it was this thing where i felt like everybody was making fun of me and i remember i was I was struggling. I was I was struggling and it was it was Janu I was struggling for so long. It was January of 2013. And I was by myself. I the US had sent me alone. I went to Austria and I was fighting a World Cup. Remember I just took fifth at the Olympics, right? I I took fifth at the Olympics and I'm fighting a World Cup, which is like bottom of the barrel on the IJF stage, right? And I make weight, I don't have the 5%, I'm doing my warm up, I'm doing my thing, but like, I just, I feel like I have this sense of like, I shouldn't be here, like I don't belong here, like I'm not here, like I'm not at these people's level, like everybody thinks I'm a joke, like I'm an American, I suck at judo, right? Look at what happened to him at the games, you can't even pull it through, like all these things are just running through my head, like I get it. And um, at the end of the day, right, when when I step onto the mat, like it's all this self-doubt is running through me. And I get through my first match. I beat this Austrian kid. Like it wasn't pretty, but I, I got through it. And my next match is against a Georgian guy. And I'm like, I'm trying to pump myself up. I'm trying to... I'm trying to fake it, right? Fake it till you make it is what they tell you. And I'm trying. Like I'm psyching myself up. I'm telling myself I'm going to beat the crap out of this guy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I walk out there and I get the crap kicked out of me. Okay? And it, and you can go watch this. Like I, I legitimately get the crap kicked out of me. I think I got three Shitos. I got thrown for a Yuko and I got thrown for two Wazaris. And I think he almost armbarred me. A Georgian guy, his name is Rekishvili. Okay, he moved up from 73 to 81 for just a little bit. And I got wrecked. And I was like, I was freaking out. And I was losing my temper. I was so pissed off. I I go to the hotel bar. I don't drink. I just, that's where you ordered the food. I just sat down at the bar and I was waiting for my lunch to go sit up in my hotel room. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm looking at everybody just enjoy the food in the buffet. But like, I was so upset, I didn't even want to go get the free food. I wanted to pay for my food at the bar as a broke athlete. I would rather have paid for my food at the bar so I could take it to my room because I didn't want to go into the room with all the athletes. So I'm sitting at the bar and I'm watching all these athletes and everybody's laughing, everybody's having fun and then they look over at me and they're laughing and I just feel like they're laughing at me, right? Because the guy that took fifth at the Olympics, he can't even make it to the quarterfinals of a World Cup. And so I send this email to Jimmy. And I'm like, ba 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 ba, And I send it to Skelly, ba 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 ba. And I'm so angry. I'm just angry. And I'm like, F it. I quit. This is useless. Like, just buy me a ticket home. I'm done. And then Jimmy convinces me. Like, we go back and forth in email. And he might have called me at that time. I'm not sure. That to just, you know what? Stay there for the week. Train and go fight Germany and I remember telling him I go you know what I don't even effing care I was like I'm done with it I go I don't care about the rules I don't care about this you know what I'm just gonna go beat some people up and if I lose on Shido's I don't even care I'm done with judo screw it screw the rules screw judo I'm just gonna grab the gi and I'm just gonna try to beat some people up and I remember going through camp just like angry and then I, I had a decent camp actually. Um, we were trying to figure out the rules. It was right it was right about the time where like the double grip break, like you couldn't break a grip off with two hands and 
it was trying to make this adjustment. I think that aggravated me too a little bit. Um, no problem, big whoa, whoa. So again, like I've, I've gotten, I've broken, right? I broke and then, and then magic happened, right? I, I basically at that point in time, I had hit my rock bottom, what I perceived as my rock bottom. Fifth at the Olympic Games to to one and one at a World Cup. Like I was I, I was at rock bottom at this point. And then I come back and I win Germany. Which right now is a Grand Slam. It was a Grand Prix at the time, but I win Germany. Right? I went from I'm done to I don't care anymore to winning Germany and the question everybody right now is asking is, well, what did you do? And it was that I just didn't care about the opinions of others anymore, right? I just, I just let it go. I don't care. You can like me. You can hate me. You can make fun of me. It doesn't matter because it doesn't affect that I can do what I want to do and I'm going to do it my way the way I want to do it. And once I once I did that, where I left that baggage aside and I won, I realized like nobody looks at you any differently. Like I remember sitting in Germany in the lobby waiting for my food again because I didn't usually eat in the cafeterias. I always took my food to my room because I'm a weirdo and that's what I did. But everybody was the same no, nothing had changed more people didn't talk to me in fact almost nobody talked to me um nobody like some people congratulated me but nobody was the way people treated me was the same right and and it and it hit me and i remember being in germany in the hotel and i was thinking to myself and i'm i'm always in my head i'm always trying to process and like justify and come up with ways that actions can be recreated right because the last thing you want to do is have success based on a fluke and and it hit me that the only thing that matters in my head in my head the only people that i actually as a judo player look down upon are the people that never have success right And and it and it hit me, it hit me because because you, you're, when you're on the circuit, when you're on the circuit, there's always those people that are always on the circuit, but they never win, right? That like they're there, and those are the people that the judo players like me look at, and we're like, oh, you're a joke, like really, you're here again, like what are you doing? And we and that's and those are real conversations that I have in my head, and that I know other athletes have in their head. And those are the people that you don't want to be. But when you're not that person, when you actually have won matches and you're competitive, there's a respect that is given where we understand as judo players that there's ups and downs and anything can happen. You can get caught by anybody. But at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is the Olympic Games, right? That's our, that's our, that's what everybody is aiming for. So when you have like consistent results and you lose one and done they're not looking at you like you're a joke the only people they look at who are a joke are the people that keep showing up and keep losing and keep showing up and keep losing right so what i did was i i took a step back like this i went whoa and i slid back right and i just I broadened my horizons i stopped looking at the events from like a microscope like this where i'm looking at it going today matters right everybody's gonna everybody's gonna look at me today if i'm a champion and they're gonna love me but then if i lose everybody's gonna make fun of me so i have to keep winning so people keep thinking i'm a champion when in reality that is a hundred percent not the case consistency is what you need like you still have to win yes but do you have to win everything absolutely not you have to be competitive at your worst and you have to be successful at your best. That is the goal. 
and and what I did when I took my when I took a step back, I went. I just looked at my career and I was like, hey, how many times have I actually like lost by Epalm? And I went, huh, not that often. I was like, how often do people like actually throw me? And then I remember looking at the stats going, huh, not that often. And um, let me see here. Let me see here. Let me see if I can find something just quickly. Uh, where would it be? It would be in live Q&A. Nope, not there. One more quick check. Nope. Nope, not there. Okay, I tried. I thought I had the stats from like a previous uh, Zoom thing I had done. But I remember looking at it going, huh, like you don't get thrown that often. You definitely don't get thrown free poem that often. So what do you have to really be embarrassed about that one guy did it? Like at, at some point, right, when you're looking at your career, in a broad sense, in a very broad sense, right, think about the number of matches that you have versus the number of times you've actually been thrown free poem. And the farther that ratio is apart, Right. And there's obviously like you don't want a 50 50. That would be awful to be 50 50. Like half your matches you get thrown by Paul. Like that's ludicrous. But what, what I did is when I looked at my actual numbers, it gave me this like overwhelming confidence because I don't lose that often. Um, I don't get thrown that often. And I surely don't get thrown for Epon that often. I think in like all of 2016, I was thrown like three times. And I think in all of like 2015, I was thrown like five times. In an entire calendar year, that includes matches where I was thrown and then I came back and won. Like maybe I pinned the guy. So a lot of times when I'm losing, it's because they're close fights and I lose by like two Shitos to one or three Shitos to one. And I'm, I lose the Shito battle a lot. Okay, because I lose that tactical edge because I play that border of like, I'm kind of cheating, but I'm kind of not. And I, I played that line as an athlete and I was okay with it. But when I looked at my career, it gave me this overwhelming confidence of, wow, people really struggle. So, so the more I looked at those numbers, the more confidence it gave me that, hey, I should just be trying to throw people all the time because it's actually really hard for people to counter you and score because not only do people actually like when they do score they were offensive throws they weren't counters per se right so when you break it up into these sub categories it gives you this confidence where you like you actually look at the numbers and say hey you've got a lot of success over here like you shouldn't be nervous because the data is telling you not to be right and then and then it hit me, right? So I'm looking at all my data and I'm I'm looking at it and then it hits me and it sounds stupid that it hit me like, duh. But at the same time, right? I, it's not something I think people look at and draw strength from, right? They don't look at it and draw strength. And I hadn't either. But then once I saw it and I saw it as this thing of power to draw strength from in order to alleviate a lot of that anxiety and that pressure that you feel, um, I was mind blown. So I stood, I'm looking back and I'm looking at my career and I go, huh, I'm a top five player in the world. And I went, hey, eat, win or lose, I'm still a top five player in the world. Like you don't just all of the sudden, right, just because you have this ranking system now where you could be at like let's say you're ranked 15th in the world and then you show up to a tournament and you lose first round like you're still there like you might drop a slot or two or maybe like five slots but you're still a top player on the world stage like that counts for something regardless of what happened today you have proven over time that you are one of the world's best judo players, competitive judo players on the scene. And if that doesn't help you compete, 
I don't know what will, right? So when I realized that and I took a step back, I actually stopped caring about the metal. It didn't matter, right? What mattered was necessarily where I was on that system. Like if I lost today, that's okay because my stats are telling me I'm just gonna win next time, which made me feel good because even though I lost today, history is telling me that, but I'm gonna have success. I'm gonna come back from this. I'm not on this never ending downward turn of nothingness, right? Like I have the capability of bouncing back and climbing the ranking systems, right? I fluctuated between like three and 10 through most of my career. I mean, there were times where like I would drop below due to like injuries and stuff, but I always climbed back. I always, I always got back up there. Um, and it, and it helped me to, to when I'm competing to just look at it as like this, Hey, you're actually good. The metal doesn't tell you you're good. History, history tells you you're good. Right. And that's, and that's where I drew my strength from. And now, so when you're starting out, right. And you're super nervous. Goal number one, just compete. Understand that you are overcoming your fear to compete. Step number two, compete often enough to where you get comfortable with it. Right. And then when you're comfortable, with the idea of actually competing, you can go into step three where you can actually look at it and figure out where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are, which in turn brings me to my next point, right? Because this is where a lot of people fail. They have this data where they know what they're good at, they know what they're bad at, but they don't know how to use it to structure their training to in turn increase their ability to feel comfortable and confident when they step out onto the mat to compete. Now, one of the things that is gonna tremendously help you as a competitor, and this isn't for the new people, right? If you're a white belt, a green belt, a blue belt, a brown belt, whatever it is, right? And if you're a jujitsu person, if you're like, uh, maybe a higher striped purple and up, this will qualify you. Um, but ideally speaking, when you are really competitive because you've been through those other stages, the way you get over anxiety is actually because you, you can't go any further, right? Once you have the stats to look at it and you're like, oh, I'm kind of comfortable here. I'm really uncomfortable here. Now the idea is how do you use that to get even more comfortable, right? To deal with that little bit more of anxiety so you can compete even better, right? The way you deal with that is you actually have a belief and a truly honest to God belief in what it is you are doing and you feel from the bottom of your heart that it is right. That way when you step out onto the mat, you believe, right? Without a shadow of a doubt, you believe that you are prepared to win. Because if you believe that, you wouldn't have a fear of losing. And the way you don't have that fear of losing is you have done your homework to figure out your strengths, your weaknesses, also your opponents, but yours, so that you can structure your training sessions to get the most improvement possible from the time you have lost to the next time you have to compete. And if you believe that you have done everything correctly, you shouldn't have a problem stepping onto that mat with confidence unless unless you are one of the moronic people that compete above your station then yeah you're going to be nervous because you know deep down you know you shouldn't be stepping on that mat at that level of an event right because when you're that high right here's a good way of putting it putting it as somebody who's a high level judo player it is easier for me to compete at the Olympic Games on an anxiety level, on an anxiety level. It is easier for me to compete at the Olympic Games than it is to compete at a local like national level tournament. 
Let that sink into you. Because at some point, the inverse is true, right? Because for the person who is overstepping, right? Like let's say you're a national level player and you're like, you know what? I'm going to go compete internationally. I'm ready for this. But deep down, you know you're not. You know you're not ready and you have that nervousness because one of two things happens, right? You're either super nervous or you're not nervous enough because you don't really care because you know you're going to lose, right? So you want to be somewhere in the middle, right? But if you're struggling with the nerves or you feel like you're having trouble getting pumped up and focused, it's because you don't care enough because you haven't done the work, right? In order to feel like you have actually won, you actually believe you're not ready to win. That that happens to people, but at the same time, right? Um, when you've overstepped, there is no overcoming that fear because deep down, you know you can't win. And you can lie to yourself. You can look yourself in the mirror and be like, I can beat them. I can beat them. And you're right. There is like those small chances, right? Like, yes, I could stand at home plate and hit a fastball from a major league pitcher. Because yes, I can swing a bat and maybe, just maybe, one time I'll hit it. But it's not something that you can recreate. Okay? And the people that overstep, they're looking for the Hail Mary fluke all the time. Right? And that's their like saving grace of trying to deal with the anxiety of the pressure. They're, they plan for the Hail Mary. And then when that plan goes to crap, they end up losing because they don't actually know or have the knowledge to dig themselves out of it. But the inverse is also true. When you're at a very high level and you have to compete down a stage or two stages, right? Because as, a, as a, somebody who wins internationally at the sport of judo, when I have to compete at the States, I'm actually dropping the level, like five or six levels to compete at our nationals. Because the level of judo in America is so low compared to Europe and Asia and other places that you you don't have anything to gain, right? Nothing good comes from winning a national title in America when you can win medals overseas, internationally. Because... We don't have enough people because they haven't been developed. Um, there's nobody there chasing it. Like We don't have two people competing and winning on the world stage in the same weight class. right? Where other countries, a lot of other countries have three or four people. right? That like one person might be winning at the Grand Slam level. One person might be winning at the World Cup level. One person might be winning at the B level. But they're winning international medals. Which means when you have a nationals, it's at least somewhat competitive. Right Right now at our nationals, it's not competitive. So what happens is those players, when they have to step down that many stages and they have nothing to lose, they're, they have this fear, right? Because I've had it. They have this fear of like being cheated being injured, right? I fought at a nationals one time where a guy did a Tomonagi and then I went to split his legs and out of nowhere, he just started frantically bicycle kicking me in the face to get me off. Frantically, like no grips, just kicking as hard as he could, MMA style. And I like, that's not even, that's not even judo. Like where'd that come from? But like, that's the kind of stuff because for him, He's fighting his Olympic Games, right? He's Because he's trying to say, hey, look, Travis Stevens has won all these medals. And if I can beat Travis Stevens, I could win these medals. And that's not true. Because if you could win those medals, you would go win those medals. That's why the idea that people in the States feel like, well, if I could beat the number one, I should get it. But it's not true, right? It doesn't matter if you can beat me. It matters if you could beat everybody else that I can beat, right? It's one of the problems with the trial system because when you qualify, right, one person could beat everybody in the world, but somebody could sit back home and just train to beat that guy who's out there actually doing the work to qualify. And so what people try to do is they try to like just beat that one guy. I hear it all the time. Like, 
hey, you beat that guy and I can beat you so I can beat that guy. Not true. There is, there is no truth to any of it. Okay, so when the guy who's up here steps down to compete, he's got nothing to gain. He's not getting better technically. He's not challenging himself mentally. Everything is on the line for them. And so it's hard. It's hard to actually get motivated for something like that. Where when you have the opportunity to be the underdog, right, and compete to somebody who you know is probably going to win, you don't mind actually throwing it all out on the line. And you actually compete your best when you're able to do that because you're, you're supposed to lose. So you'll go for broke, right? You're not going to technically try to like edge it out. You're going to do your best to prove that you're better because even if you lose, nobody's going to make fun of you because you're supposed to. All you're trying to do is fight so hard that it can be close. Because then people will respect you because you went toe to toe with one of the top level players, and then people will people will raise your status a little bit, right? It's kind of like in jujitsu why everybody wants to kind of fight Gordon, right? And why Gordon's like, well, I'll make a name for you because you're going to compete against me because he's that guy who's up here right now, and the people that are down here are trying to trying to raise their profile by competing against him, and. And so when you're, when you're trying to overcome these stages, you have to actually have these systems in place. And I remember, I remember when I finally overcame it. I finally overcame it. Got to get the coffee. Got to get the coffee. So I finally overcome all this. I'm looking at the roster. I believe it. And it's working. And it's working. And for some reason, for some reason, my my life, I don't know why it is, but throughout my entire career, my life always took like a downward spiral in the summer. I have no idea why. It's just shit would hit the fan for me and it would just go like crazy, crazy time, like crazy things would happen. Right, like, like get this, a month, a month before the Olympic Games, I'm driving out into the woods. I'm in the middle of nowhere, right? I'm doing 45 down a highway, doing 45 down, crazy stuff happens all the time. Doing 45 down a highway. Cop, out of nowhere, there's, I haven't passed a car in like an hour. Cop, out of nowhere, pulls me and my, my buddy over, my trainer, because we're going out into the woods to like get ready for the Olympics, pulls me over and he's like, hey, so you have an unpaid parking ticket from eight years ago. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I'm gonna have to arrest you. And he arrests me, allows my friend to drive the car to the police station, puts me in a, a jail cell, right? In, inside his police station, takes my fingerprints, takes my mugshot. I'm sitting there for like three hours. Finally, they they figure out how to get a hold of a judge to arrange bail, right? This is a month before the Olympic Games in Rio, mind you. Like the summer for me has been like this. It happens all the time, like crazy stuff happens. And I've never, I've never been able to compete well at the world championships. I have never made it to the quarters of the worlds. One and done, one and one, three and one, like never made it to the quarters of a world. So I take a step back in my career, right? Right around like 2013-ish, 2014-ish. And I go find a sports psychologist and she gave me the absolute best advice I've ever gotten from a psychologist on how to prepare and do visualization for sport performance. And ever since she gave it to me and I've used it, it has been a game changer for me, right? And I can see somebody in here like, how does visualization pre, pre-match routine and success and all that, but let's go into this visualization thing because Jimmy has always been and has always preached to me from the very, very beginning, visualize. And we used to, 
and we used to lay down on the mats after really hard sessions for like a minute and we used to close our eyes and we used to think to ourselves and picture ourselves on the podium and do all these things and picture yourself taping your fingers and doing all these things. He used to walk us through it, right? He used to walk us through the day, through all the matches and you would think about who's your first match? How are you gonna beat them? What are you gonna do? How's your second match? How's this, how's that? And I used to do it and I thought I was doing it right. And I thought I was doing it right. And everybody told me I was doing it right, but for some reason, I just couldn't I just couldn't get through the worlds. So I'm meeting with this girl and we're on like four or five sessions and she's hearing me out. She's understanding what the sport is. She's understanding how everything works out, how I cut weight, how I travel. She's taking all this into consideration and she and she goes like this. She goes, here's what I want you to try to do. Here's what I want you to try to do. And she said, I want you to close your eyes. And she walks me through this, right? She goes, close your eyes. And you guys could try this while I do it, right? You could try it right now. Just close your eyes and then think about what it feels like to step onto the tatami, right? Just think about, just close your eyes and then think about what it's like to step onto the tatami, right? Like, how do you, and she, she said, don't picture anybody. She said, what I want you to do, what I want you to do is I want you to think about what it feels like to step onto the tatami. Like, is your heart racing? Are you sweating? Is the crowd cheering? Is it silent? How does the mat feel? And she goes into all these sensations that you would feel. And then she says, okay. And she says, okay, now, how does it feel to grab your opponent for the first time. Like, what's that feeling? Are you nervous? Do you have anxiety? Do your fingers hurt, right? What's running through your head? And then she goes, okay, okay. And then she says, okay, you're a minute and a half in and you get a penalty. How do you feel? How do you take that? And then basically what she does is she goes through all these match type scenarios where it's more about the emotion and the physical response to every situation that could potentially happen in a match, right? Like, how do you feel attacking? Like, how do you feel when you get up and you've missed a throw? How do you feel when your opponents tried to throw you and they haven't succeeded? And basically what happened was I got so good at being able to mentally visualize the stimulus of the fight that I could actually get like goosebumps and get like my hairs to stand up and I could get my heart to race. And basically what she said was, what you're doing is, is you're training your body and your mind to fight and compete and go through the anxiety, right? the anxiety and the nervousness through your system on a cellular level, okay? And when you can do that, you could fight a hundred matches, right? Over the period of the time, having not actually risked the physical beating to your body. So what happens is, is when you've done that and you have fought it emotionally, emotionally and neurologically you have fought the matches time and time again when it comes time to actually step back out onto the mat your body's neurological response is a hundred percent used to that sensation and when i could do that i was like it's normal this is normal for me now that like it's no different because I have actually sat back and I had fought the Olympic Games in Rio 50, 60 times, right? Because you're not picturing, you're not actually picturing, like I don't have to picture Turkish Vili in the semi. All I have to think is Olympic semifinal, how do I feel? What happens when things don't go my way? How do I respond? How do I physically feel? Do my lungs burn? Right? Did I not get a good warm up and I get that throat burn? That's really hard. That sucks. Don't ever do that. Make sure you get a good warm up. Right? Like, I, f I know what it feels like to have my face like ran across the tatami. I know what it's like to feel that grip break and that pain in my hands. 
right? I know what it's like to attack and miss and hit the floor in transition, right? And I can feel those things and I can pay attention to what my body's chemical reaction is on a, on a neurological side in order to fight those matches time and time again. Because one of the things, one of the things that I told her that always happened to me was this. I had no problem. I had no problem visualizing myself winning before, right? I would always do it. I'd be like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw this guy with Uchimata. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw him. I, I would picture it. I would picture it all the time. I'd be like, this is what's going to do. I'm going to grab him by the back. I'm going to pull him and I'm going to smash him. I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to grab him. I'm going to pump and I'm going to smash him. And what would happen is I would convince myself of this story so much so that I would get tunnel vision. And what would happen is I would be digging for this Uchimata and I'd be I'd be getting the grips and I'd be fighting for it. That I would actually miss every other opportunity to score to score. And I would actually lose matches because I was too stubborn. Because I had pictured myself throwing them with this throw or beating them in this way, that I wouldn't make a game plan change. Because then I felt like I was a failure. Like, no, I said I was going to do this. I'm going to go do it. And and when she took that away, she took it out of the equation and focused more on just the feeling, it left me to be able to see all of the different opportunities in order to win. Now, I don't know if this happens to you, right? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Not really sure. But one of the things that used to happen to me all the time right was you'd be you'd like I'd be standing in the shoot ready to go out and I'm seeing the guy in front of me and I'd know how to beat him right like I've just trained with him before or I've competed against him before like I know I'm going to win this and you're standing there and sometimes you could stand there for 20 minutes right so you're thinking about it you're thinking about it you're in your head you're visualizing it you're thinking about it but for some reason some obscure reason without without knowing why this like negative thought comes into your head and you're like but what if he counters it? And then from that that like split second of a thought of, but what if he counters it? Or like you visualize yourself getting countered. Like it happens to me, right? You actually go down this rabbit hole of like, well, if he does that, I'll do this. And if he does that, I'll do this. And all you're doing is putting that negative condensation into your mind that you can be countered. Which then when you go to step out onto the mat, you have this fear of actually being able to pull the trigger and give one of your throws 100%. Is what, and that's what you need to do if you're going to score in the sport of judo. And, and that was one of the things that she helped me deal with by just being able to remove it and not think about the person or think about the throw, but think about the feelings in the match that you would have, those sensations. And when I was able to do that, boom, skyrocket, no problems. All right. Oh, I love this. I love this. Let's look at this right here. I wish, I wish this was the slogan for USA Judo. I, I wish it was. But on top of that, the, the reason why I love, I love this. I, I don't know who this person is, but hey man, air high five. Now let me explain this to everybody really quick. Because this is part of the mental game too. Winning is a habit just like anything else it's not something that you just get it's a habit that you create okay and now let's take the first part of the statement here it's very easy to learn how to win right the key word in in that little statement right there is learn you have to learn how to win right and and I think a lot of people just think if they work hard, that in turn they will win. But that's not how it works. The people that work the hardest aren't necessarily the most successful. Okay, that's why some, you know, high school dropouts, college dropouts can run some of the most successful businesses because they learn. 
They don't just think that because they show up and because they think they try hard that they're going to be able to win. You Learning, winning and learning are not together. You have to have somebody, which is why I think coaching is so important when we go back to the USA Judo route rants, that you have to have somebody teach you how to win in such a way that it can be recreated. You have to learn that process. And the easiest way to do that is to have somebody show you. The more difficult route is to just trial by trial by fire. Let's just let's just keep trying until we figure it out on our own. And you hope that the athlete is intelligent enough to pick up on it and be able, right, to actually realize what the consistency are in his winning versus his losing right so i love that part right there then the reason why i love the second the second half of the statement but it's very hard to learn how to lose okay now now with that statement right there is a wrong way to win and there is a right way to lose let that sink in for a second. There is a wrong way to win and there is a right way to lose. It's not just about winning, right? I have yelled, yelled and gotten physical with some of my athletes because of how they won. And I have shaken their hand and hugged them because of how they lost. Because I am more proud of what they did when they lost than the crazy shenanigans that they did in order to win. Because for me as a coach, I'm trying to get consistency, right? So I don't care that my athlete loses because some player did some fluky technique that we've never seen, right? I don't want my athletes to respond to those things at such a young age, right? Anybody, anybody can catch somebody with a trick. I tell you that right now. You can catch anybody with a trick. The problem is, is that trick only works once or twice. And therefore, when you run into that athlete again, and now that we know it, we can develop a game plan. It'll just never happen again. Super simple. As long as that athlete stays disciplined, and when they go off on like this crazy wild ride of making stuff up in order to win, it's hard to get that development to really happen and the discipline to happen in order to build a consistency so that you can get them to win, right? Oh, oh, he's from Alberta, Canada, if you guys didn't see that in the chat. Oh, here's a, here's a good one right here. Paralysis through analysis pre-fight. The waiting is the worst. Oh, you're telling me. Right? So here was another like, I got I got four minutes here. So here's my last like little like hiccup that I had in my career. Um, that I didn't really think was a problem until this happened. And it happened at the World Championships. So I had this routine down. Right, which every athlete should have. There's no right or wrong routine. It's just a routine. And I would always go out and into the tunnel three matches before. All right, so that you get your gi checked on match three. Then you stand in the shoot till the end of that. The next group goes out, and then you go out, and then you know whatever happens happens. Right, and I used to do this thing where like when it's time to go out. Like when I was going through the shoot, it was like game time. Like I would put my game face on. Like, here we go. I'm focused now. Right now, it's 100% focus time. This is my time. We're going to get focused. We're going to get in it. And then I'm at the World Championships. It's round one, mind you. Remember I told you, summer times, crazy stuff happens. Round one, I'm fighting a guy from Hungary. And the guy's giving me like crap for my gi. And I'm like what is the deal like the guy checked it the other guy checked it now you got to check it and eventually they tell me i can't wear it right it goes all the way to the head guy big jim's furious i gotta change my gear okay no problem so we get back into 
back into it, right? I'm getting myself psyched up. I'm ready to go. And before I know it, like 15 minutes has passed and I've been standing there psyching myself up because the first match, right? I'm three. So there's a match out there fighting. It's like 12, 15 minutes into golden score. So it's been going on forever. It finally ends. Next guy goes out and I'm psyching myself up. I'm psyching myself up. Guy gets injured. There's like a blood thing that's happening and he keeps bleeding. And that match goes like 15 minutes into golden score. Like it's just running on and on because they have to keep stopping this match. So I ended up standing in that shoot trying to psych myself up for almost 40 minutes, right? And so basically what I did for 40 minutes was I raised my heart rate to get amped up and I held it there. So I basically ran an eight minute mile for 40 minutes because I kept my heart rate probably around like 140-ish, which isn't a lot, right? We get it into the 200s when we're competing, but it's up there, it's above normal. And then by the time I was ready to walk out there, I was dizzy, I was thirsty, and I was just out of it. And I remember thinking to myself like, what did I just do to myself? And of course I lost, which mind you in golden score, I lost on a penalty from the ref, again with the penalty. Yeah, Paul, it was insane. But but it taught me this, this lesson Right, we're like, I actually, up until this point, right, I have fought two Olympic games, two Olympic games. One of them I took a fifth at, but I'm at like 2014-ish. Might have been 13, I think it was 14 though when this happened. And it never, it never crossed my mind to actually look at myself and go, Travis, how long does it actually take you to psych yourself up to get ready to go? Like why did we pick why did we pick when we walk into the shoot? And I think I think when I was younger what I was doing was, well, I'm in front of my opponent and I don't want to show weakness. So I'm gonna I'm gonna i I'm gonna go in there with my game face. But it's like it's not like you're intimidating anybody. People aren't intimidated by you. Like they know who you are. They've you've worked out with each other, you fought against each other, like you're not hiding anything. So then why are you trying to intimidate people? For 40 minutes. And I thought to myself like. I could probably get this done in like. Four minutes. Five minutes. Like loosen up the joints. You know shake my arms out. And then once I realized that. I went huh. So <laughs> funny story. I'm getting ready to fight Turchish Vili, right. And it's the semifinal of the Olympics. Okay. I get called into the shoot. I get there and I realized that like nobody's going anywhere right like they have to fight that whole match they got to fight both sides then they got to leave then we have to get ready then they had to wait for the tv people then we got to go out there and then we got to walk out like there's time so what i do is i back my chair up to the wall i sit in it i throw my hands behind my head and i throw my feet out so jimmy and chris skelly who's the manager come running up and like travis hey you got to fight. Are you ready? And I go, I got this. Don't worry about it. But I was being me. I was being relaxed. It wasn't time yet. It wasn't time to turn that clock on and get ready. But when you watch the Olympic footage and you see me in that shoe, you see game time, like ready to go. Mind you, two minutes before, I was 100% relaxed. I was conserving all my energy. I was hanging out. I was enjoying the atmosphere. I was enjoying the moment. Because it wasn't time yet. I didn't need that much time. I only needed like four minutes. And then I used that four minutes and I hadn't burned any extra energy and I was ready to step onto that mat ready to go. So you have to take a you have to take an overall look at everything that goes into this from the very beginning. Right? Yeah, there was no adrenaline dump. Dude, that's the worst. Adrenaline dump, man. Oh. Here's a, you know what? I'm over my time. I'm over my time, but I got a little bit of coffee left. I got a little bit of coffee left. I'm getting wired. I'm getting super wired here, but here we go. Here's a, here's a little tidbit 
here's a little tidbit for you guys. Okay, because we're talking about like the mental side of it. Okay. And remember, remember what Chris says here. Not not Chris, I'm sorry, not you. Not you. Who was it? Right here, right here. Add this right here. Right here. Milan? 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 I don't know. Where are you from again? Canada somewhere. Alberta. Okay, remember, learn how to win. Learn how to win. Okay. So here, here's a pro tip for you guys. Here's a pro tip. Define winning. And, and I know what most of you are thinking right now, right? You're thinking, well, you have to throw or beat the other person in order to win. But... But there are micro levels to winning, right? Because you can set goals for yourself that determine whether you win or whether you lose, right? So here's a couple of examples of things that I would do in order to ensure that I am teaching myself to A, set a goal, B, learn how to win, which in turn builds my confidence in order to look at a situation and say, I can do this. I got this. Right? Because when I was when I was at the Olympic semifinal and I'm sitting there in the chair and he's running at me saying, Hey, what the hell are you doing? Get up, get ready. And I'm like, hey, I got this. I remember when I was in the back at the Olympics, right? I just qualified for the semifinals, right? I pinned the Bulgarian guy and I'm in the back. I got my gi off. I'm walking around. I'm because one of the important things as an athlete, right? Paul can back me up here, is you never want to go from a hundred percent exertion to zero percent exertion you want to wind yourself down okay and then you can build yourself back up but what i did was i threw my gi off and i'm walking around i'm shaking my arms out and i'm rolling my shoulders and i'm moving around because i'm i'm still amped right so i want to keep moving i want to fall to zero big jim comes up to me right and he pulls this grungy piece of paper out of his pocket and it had been the paper of all of the notes that we had taken on the 10 athletes that we had picked that to study in order to win the Olympic Games. And Turchis really was obviously on that list, okay? And he pulls out the piece of paper and he pulls out his name on his piece of paper and goes, look, here's the notes, here's what you gotta do. And I, I put my hand over the paper and I push Big Jim's hand away and I Big Jim. We trained all summer for this. We trained all summer for this, okay? I know exactly what that piece of paper did, says, we did a good job. I'm ready. I got this. Don't worry. And he went, are you sure, kid? And I'm like, I got this. And he's like, all right. And he put the paper back in his pocket. And then I went on like relaxing, staying loose, getting ready. And then again, continued because I have done this thing where I have micro gold myself to learn how to be successful in order to see opportunity and then be able to accomplish the steps to get it. And what you do is you just, you make it up. You 100% make it up. And the idea and the reason why you're making it up is because your opponent doesn't understand what's going on. They don't realize that you're winning and you're feeling confident and you're feeling good about yourself because you saw this opportunity and you did it. So here are a couple examples of things that I used to do, right? Example number one. Right? And this is something that all of you can do because we're all going through it. When I used to come back from major injuries, which I had a ton of, one of the goals that I would set for myself that nobody knew, only I knew, right? because it, it's got to be in here, okay? is every time I get off the floor, like when we're doing Tachi Waza and we fall down, I always have to be the first one up. No matter how tight, no matter who got thrown, it doesn't matter. Just be the first guy up. That's it. You see, it sounds it sounds ridiculous, but it's so empowering because now what you've done as somebody who is out of shape, whose goal is to get back in shape, you've given yourself a task to ensure that you can accomplish your goal of getting back in shape, regardless of the outcome of the judo match. So you could actually get the crap kicked out of you at practice, but you can leave feeling 100% accomplished that you accomplished your goal. You did what you set out to do. 
and it'll be hard. Sometimes I was super grateful that my opponents would lay there for like an extra 10 seconds because I needed it. But the second I saw him flinch, I would dart back up. Right? Super simple, super easy, but learn how to set it, learn how to do it, and feel good that you can do that. Okay? Goal number two that I used to do when I was in shape. Okay? Goal number two that I would do when I was in shape is we would do these lineups, right? You would do like five one minute rounds of Tachi Waza where every minute you would get a fresh person, okay? And my goal would be to throw somebody three times, right? I would have to throw you three times in order to feel like I was accomplished. Regardless of your skill level, I would just, every time a person came out, I would just pick a number, two, three, four. I want to do two throws with one transition. And I would just pick these obscure numbers and I would tell myself right when I see them, like, because I make that gut instinct, right? The no thought, no nothing. Guy comes at me. I see a lefty coming at me. I want to throw him three times. And then I just do it. I fight and I fight and I fight until I get those three throws. It doesn't matter that I get thrown. No one cares because my goal is to throw you three times right? Sometimes I would see a big guy come out and I'd be like, I got to throw you twice. That's it. And I would get angry, right? Somebody, some people would look at me and they'd be like, why did you do that to that guy? And it was like, there was 20 seconds left. Like you threw him two other times. Why in the last 20 seconds did you have to get so physical and rough with him and throw him? Because I set a goal. I had to do it. I taught myself how to train with that intensity because I set a goal and I pulled it out of myself. It's not just about the workout. Sometimes, sometimes I would see people come at me that are a little bit more talented, right? And I'd be like, hey, I have to throw you with this. Like maybe it's, maybe I'm fighting a lefty. Like maybe I'm fighting Colton, right? And I'm like, you know what? I got to throw you a drop sale. And I would just dig and dig and dig and dig. And when I didn't get it, I'd get angry. I get super angry, right? I might have thrown him with a coach. I might have thrown him with a sumi to think I could set up the drop sale later. But I'd be so pissed off if I didn't get that drop sale. Because I'm teaching myself what's important. Learning how to win. Because sometimes, sometimes you're going to run into a lefty where you're going to have to be able to throw him with a drop sail. Sometimes you're going to have to be able to like, I got to throw this guy with a sumi. Sometimes you're going to be down on a score. There's going to be 20 seconds left and you're going to need that intensity and know how to dig and create an opportunity that you need to score on. It's not just about working out, people. Lex, that's right. That like... People, people look at judo as like a who through who, right? I tell people all the time, like when, when I used to work out at camps, right? When I would go to Tokai, when I would go to like all these places to work out and somebody threw me, it was almost, com- like I'd almost laugh. It's almost comical, right? Because they're not throwing the Travis Stevens who's competing. They're throwing the Travis Stevens who is actively looking to improve and get better, Right, I'm not trying to get thrown, mind you, but when it happens, I understand that I am doing certain things, putting myself at a greater risk in order to develop as a judoka. Right, like you have to, if you want to be able to throw somebody in the sport of judo, you have to be open to being thrown. There is no position, zero, zero. I don't care what you tell me. There is not one position in the sport of judo where you can throw your partner and they cannot throw you. Not possible. If you have the ability to throw your partner, they ensure have the ability to throw you back. So if you're if you find yourself standing Right, and you're doing judo, just off topic here. If you find yourself while you're working out and doing judo and you're like, I can't find an angle to throw, I feel like I can't I can't get an attack off, 
that's probably because you're being too defensive and your partner probably feels the same way, right? Because if I'm fighting somebody where they feel overly defensive, this happens all the time when I work out with people, like when I go to different clubs and I'm training, they're like, I just feel like I can't get close to you. And it's like, that's because you're pushing me away. And I can ream off attack after attack after attack because you're too far away to throw me. My attacks don't even really have to be that successful. You're just going to look like an idiot for five minutes. Like I don't throw that many people at all these camps. It's more about just pushing and pulling and controlling and knocking them off balance because they're so defensive that the actual opportunity is not there. And I'm not willing to put forth the effort to create it because I'm a fat, out of shape human being. It just is what it is. Pablo, that's right. You got to take the risk if you want to win. You have to put yourself in danger if you want to score. There is no safety net in there. None. And what I realized, right, going back, going back, if you missed this, I talked about my stats and how I drew strength from it. It taught me this. I was able to pull this out of it. Most of the time, most players... Right, If they're the same skill level, okay, same skill level, mind you, we're not talking about a skill gap here. There could be a little bit, but, but generally in the same ballpark, right? If they are attacking most, I, I would venture to say it's 90% and above. Most people, if you really try, like you give it, you give it 100% effort, nine times out of 10, they are doing the first thing they are doing is getting out of the throw. Okay, that is why counters usually don't happen at the highest level. Okay, they do when there's a skill gap. Okay, or an athlete has done something where they've done the same attack too many times, and then the other guy catches on, and then they're able to counter it. Right, but but for the most part, like. If you just fire your throw with 100% effort, nine times out of 10, the other guy is solely playing defense. He's not actually thinking counter, right? Whereas me, if you outgrip me, my job, right? If I'm outgripped, my job is to stand there and go, how is he going to throw me? Okay, I have to leave that door open just enough so that he does it, but then I can counter, Right, so that's that higher level thinking. But for the most part, for everybody here, if you gave it the good old college try and really gave it your all, right, most of the time they will always think defense, which is why when we talk about like counters and how many times I've been countered, it's not that often compared to the number of times I've really tried to throw people, okay. Whoa, Dojo Outfitters is here. Nice. Whoa, we're, we're really getting out, man. We got some people in here. Maybe I should keep going. My timer ran out like ages ago, right? Like 20 minutes ago, and then I just kept going. Lucas, I'm glad you liked the content and my rant here on the mental stuff. Boom. Look at this. Judo Strangles is fantastic. Guys, 30% off Judo Fanatics, Dojo Outfitters, Andy Hong. I think he's got two or three up there. Check him out. I'm hearing nothing but great reviews. Also, if you guys need geese. Fuji Sports and Hadashita Sports, 30% off as well. Memorial Day sale. Go get some stuff. Go do that. <laughs> There's a brick wall I need to run through. <laughs> as long as it's not me. Don't try to run through me. I'm not, I'm not that guy anymore. Oh. Uh. Oh, here, back, back to this whole like goal setting thing, right? Because I, I talked about like some of the things I did, like one was getting up, one was like a number of attacks in a certain time, 
One was a specific throw against a specific player and making sure I could force it and I could make sure I actually can create the opportunity in which it was to score. Now, here's another one. Here's another one. And hold on, I'm trying to follow chat really quick. Um, here's another one that a lot of people don't realize because um, people always ask me, Travis, how do you how do you overcome injuries, right? Like you've had some serious injuries in your past and that's right. I have currently three herniated discs in my neck. I have a bulging disc at C7. Um, I've separated my SI joints. I've broken 12 ribs. I actually won nationals one year with nine broken ones. Broken all my fingers, all my toes, uh, fractured my collarbone. Uh, I had surgery on both knees. Um, tore my right hamstring twice. Tore my left one once. Um, spun my ankle in a full 360 and shattered my cuboid bone. Uh, Liz Frank fracture in my foot. Bunch of broken toes. Uh, fractured my wrist. Well, I've broken my wrist too, but just thinking like ones I've done in judo. Uh, almost had my leg amputated. That's true. Yeah, the concussion. That was that was super bad. That was like scary bad. Oh. Oh. For those of you guys that like think you've had a concussion because you feel a little dizzy or a little nauseated, there there's like there's like levels to it. And I've had like the severe of the severe where like I was dating, I'm still dating Kalita, right? Still dating, no, not to be confused, but I was dating Kalita and when, when the concussion happened, right? Funny story. I wake up to like white, pure white. And the reason why I'm looking at pure white is there's a doctor like this to me, right? There's a doctor like this to me. And all I see is his white coat. And then like, I like back up and I, I'm trying to like let my eyes adjust to the light like I've just woken up, okay? And I see Dusseldorf and I'm like, what? And the doctor's asking me all these questions and I'm like confused, but I finally come to where like I can have normal conversations with people, right? But I'm totally lost. I'm totally lost. Like I have no idea what's going on. And I'm, I'm walking through the warm-up area, right? And I'm walking and I'm walking and I'm looking around. And there's this girl, right? There's this blonde girl. And she's looking at me. She's giving me the like the most evil look. And I'm like looking at her and I'm like, the fuck did I do? So I go up to Skelly and I'm like, Skelly, who is that? Like, did I kill her dog today? Is that is that why she's mad at me? She's giving me like the strangest look, like I did something wrong. I have no idea who she is. And he looks at me and he's like, you don't know who that is? And I'm like, should I? And then it took me, I don't know, I wanna say like an hour and a half after by the time like I'd woken up from the doctor and had this conversation with Skelly before I realized and I got like the memories back of like we were actually dating. Like that's how bad this was. Like I just, I had no recollection. I have so much, like my recollection is so bad that my actual memory of the warm-up area is from a different tournament. Because I actually know Germany really well because it's my favorite place to compete. So when I'm thinking about that warm-up area and like her surroundings in this environment, it's not the warm-up area that's in Germany. Crazy. Crazy. So... <laughs> So one of the things I was going to get to is I remember uh, when I broke my ankle and it spun in that 360 and I had to go like get it popped back in, go put a boot on, go have surgery and like get like the things put in there and figured out. Um, I got the concussion because I threw a guy with Uchimata so hard, I basically knocked myself out. Yeah, I did win the match. Totally worth it. No, it really wasn't. It really wasn't. Uh, but what I was going to say is, specifically with my ankle, um, <clears throat> it was my left foot at the time. 
um, which is my plant foot for Uchimata, Harai, Osoto, all those throws. And I remember, I remember like when I would be working out when I when I first took the boot off, okay, when I when I first I think a better example a better example would be when I had knee surgery. Okay, because that was really close to the games. Um Yes, there is footage of it. You can go you can go watch it. Um and I actually teach that Uchimata in my Uchimata DVD which is coming out. Um you can go to Judo Base and find it. Uh, actually, actually, maybe, maybe I'll do this. Maybe we'll do this. Let me see something here. Um, I'm kind of in the middle of like two computers, so, uh, maybe, Maybe we could do something like Shablam. Look at that. Look at that. Look at what we can do. We got to turn this down. Here we go. So Alan Schmidt. Right? This is the match. Here we go. We're going to do this. We're just going to do it. Here we go. I'm going to put myself up here in the corner. Here we go. We're not going to watch the whole thing. Not that important. Uh, yeah. And so this is what people don't under... Tech skills. <laughs> If I was more organized, because I just switched computers, like I, I'd be able to find some other things too. Um, and what most people don't understand is, it. I don't think it's necessarily how hard your head hits. Um, I think I think a lot of it has to do with like the angles of like your head and neck and how that hits. And if you find the right angle, like. Your neck could snap like a twig. Uh, no, YouTube YouTube won't ban me for this one because uh, I actually, this is okay by the people who own it. Um, but let's just go to this section. So we're going to go to the back here. And let's just, here we go. And let's just watch this exchange. So for those of you guys that don't know, I do a cross grip sleeve Uchimata right on right and I do that by swinging my partner behind me and then turning my elbow up uh, and it works beautifully m most of the time um, and at the end of the day even if I can't score with it it makes for a good attack which is usually what I use it for it's just to if I feel like I need to get an attack to you know try to get to two to one or three to one to try to get my partner a Shido um, but here we go let's see what happens when we do this let's just play it here here it goes. So you can see me cut that angle. There it is. And I spin him behind. Whoop, bang. That's it. That's all it was. Okay, I'm going to back this up a little bit. You can see I'm like super bent. Right here. And now, this is a terrible position. Like super terrible. Like look how bent I am. This looks like garbage. Like super garbage. Like... The fact that it even worked is surprising because Schmitz, I think, a world bronze medalist, European medalist, like he's a good player. But I had that, I'm going to use a big word here, I don't even know if I'm using it right, but centripetal force, right? I had him spinning so much that like that foot just grazely missed the ground, right? We're, we're like an inch off the ground here probably. Boom. And you can see, like, let me back this up just like, whoa. Right there. He's not even on the floor yet. So if I go like one second, like bang, right there. You can see my head right there on the floor. That. So the rule in judo for head diving is you have to hit the back of your head by going over the top. Okay, and you can see that I'm hitting the side of my head, which makes this completely legal. But like Paulo's saying, like I hit directly on my temple, like it just like smacked the floor, and 
And I remember when this first came out that let me let me see if we can do this. I'm going to I'm going to play the audio. I'm going to play it really loud and I'm just going to be quiet. And I think if I remember correctly, um still got the W though. That's right. Go big or go home. I went big and got a W and then went home. Um listen to the audio, so turn up your audio here and I'm positive you'll hear a boom boom. And then it'll look like he hit the floor. That first boom is my head on the floor. So let me back this up and see if we can hear that audio. No. There's a, there used to be a clip online where there's a camera right here where you could hear like the swishing of the mat that was playing and you could hear the doof doof. It's not here though. But anyways, so this was the throw that did it. And I'm just going to let it play. So he calls Mate and then watch what happens. Watch what happens. And we'll just turn down this audio. See, he's holding his shoulder because he actually separated his shoulder when I did this. He landed right on his collarbone and it dislocated. That's how hard this throw was. It doesn't look like much, but it was super hard. And I just collapse. I'm like completely out of it. Just loopy. And then I'm like, okay, here we go. Running on pure like my body just knows what to do here. I have no recollection of any of this. Not even the throw. They award it. Off we go. Now, from what I've been told, right? From what I've been told. Let's get rid of this. Let's just go back here. From what I've been told, um, Big Jim took me to the bathroom. And then he was waiting outside. And then the next thing they know, they found me in the corner of a stadium looking into the corner. Like I had the back to the room. I was in the corner like a child who was in trouble. And I was rocking back and forth, crisscross applesauce, rocking back and forth, whistling to myself in the corner. And when they found me like that, that's when they knew they were like, Travis is done. He's not fighting anymore. Oh. Oh, crazy. Super chat. Nice. I cannot even begin to say your name. But thank you for that. And yeah, I tried to set the timer and like, you know, follow it. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do another hour and see what happens. Maybe. Um But yeah. Uh Dojo Outfitter, serious question. Do you think weight cutting makes you susceptible to more concussions? I'm not a doctor. I have no idea. Um, I would think not. I I mean, let, let me rephrase that. I would say to the extreme case of weight cutting, yes. But to the average person who cuts weight, I, I would think not. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm not a doctor. So I'm just pulling that answer like right out of my butt. I'm just, I got no idea. I have no idea like the actual like water depreciation lack of nutrition to the brain does it make it like i don't know i got no idea we're not talking about that we're talking about mental stuff so what i was going to talk about um was when i had knee surgery coming back when i when i had knee surgery and i was coming back because this is important super important because remember the micro goal you got to learn how to win it is super important and super vital learn how to win um, when I was coming back, I remember going to my first workout, super excited. I was like, I'm, I'm back. I'm, I'm doing it. Let's go. And, and you don't, the most embarrassing thing, right? I'm a, I'm an athlete. Like I'm pretty good at being an athlete. Like I'm not a champion athlete. Like I'm not a big time CrossFitter, but like when I go into a gym, like people look at me and they're like, oh, he's an athlete. Like. Who's that guy? He's pretty strong. Look at that guy. Man, what does he do? Like people look at me as like an athlete. And when I went to the gym and I start working out, we we go into plyos. And and the strangest the strangest thing happened. And and I couldn't I couldn't even fathom 
this. And Paul is here. Paul is here, right? Paul, Paul, back me up here. Listen up for this. Hopefully, hopefully you can back me up here in the thing. Craziest thing happened. My therapist and my trainer are there, and they're like, "Okay, Travis, how's your leg feel?" I go, "It feels pretty good. Like I'm walking around. I'm moving. I can do a squat. Okay, I can't. I can't get my heel to my butt yet. Okay, but but I can get it into a wedge to pass the 45 because that scar tissue is in there, right?" So I'm walking, I can walk up and down stairs, everything is good. So he goes, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have you do plyos. And all I want you to do is we're gonna take a three inch box and I just want you to take your good leg and I want you to hop up onto the box, okay? And my hands are up against the wall to my left, right? And there's a wall in the front. So I'm kind of like in a corner, right? But, the, but it's more like a doorway, right? Because there's a door so I could go past it in the front. And I'm standing there and I hop up on the box with my left leg and I'm like, what are we doing? Like, I need to get, like the Olympic Games is coming up. What am I doing? Like, we're like six months out, like a three inch box. So I, I, I do my five hops, we hop up there. And then I go onto my bad leg, the leg I had just had surgery on, right? And I hadn't realized how much I had actually lost in my right leg. I... I didn't have enough oomph and power in my leg to get on top of the three inch box. Six months before the Olympic Games. I I actually stumbled and had to catch myself because I tripped on the three inch box. And I remember like looking at it like what the f- Fuck. And people are looking at me, right? Going going back, going back to what I had originally said, that feeling of embarrassment, right? Where you feel like everybody's looking at you embarrassed. And if you don't get past that into a, a sense of like belief, things like what just happened to me where like I stumble on a three inch block would get discouraging, right? Because as you as you tend to fail or suffer or struggle to get through things, right? The people in the gym, they don't know me from apples from apples, right? Like I'm just a, I'm just a person to them. They look at me like a big strong guy, I'm like walking around, stomping around. So when he's stumbling on a three inch block, it's almost comical. Like why is this guy who is clearly an athlete like stumbling on this three inch block? It's almost like something you would make fun of somebody for. But because I had done all the mental prep where I know who I am and I focus internally on myself and. And I know I've gone through those stages to bring it down so that those types of things don't affect me anymore, right? When when I stumble on that box and I realize the gym stops, right? Like people are looking at me now. I go, okay, that's clearly a mistake. We gotta, we gotta do this again. And my trainers are like, are you all right? And I was like, we're gonna do it again. Sh- sure enough, like I just, I can't even at this point I can't even get my foot because I missed that jump. I can't get my foot to leave the floor. And because I, I'm so afraid, I'm so scared, not, not of the people and being embarrassed. Like you can actually see me, like I'm, I got my hand on the wall, I got my hand on the wall, and you can actually see me like, like I'm trying to like, like I'm like trying to like do that and I can't do it. I just, I can't, I can't bring myself to try to jump on this box. And, and the Olympic Games is in like six months and I'm, I'm like, I'm done. Like it's over. Like what? I can't, I can't do this. I'm way, I'm too far gone. I'm way too far gone. And, and what happens to a lot of people is they don't understand the power of the micro goal. The, the little thing, the little thing that you can do today that is super important, right? And when you try to take where you are today to where you need to be, that journey, that path, that can seem impossible, right? But when you look at it as like a, what can I do today? What can I do today? I did this, now what can I do today? And you just say, hey, 
we're going to dumb this down so much, so much that you're going to be able to set 20 goals in a day and do 20 goals, not 19, right? And if we can only get to 19, goal number one on day two is going to be the 20, right? So we basically set it up to, okay, step one, walk, step two, body weight, step three, range of motion. And basically we didn't even, like it's not even talked about plyos, right? We basically remove it entirely from the situation. And we go back to just what can Travis do today that he can be told to do from a professional that he trusts in order to feel accomplished like he is making improvements, right? Because it's an interpretation. Improvements is an interpretation. Um, and so what we did is we backed it up and we said, okay, I know, I know how I can get you on top of that box. And I said, well, how is that? And Paul knows, and Paul, if he's here, he could probably back me up here. He might've had to have left, but you can do like these weird, like mind tricks where kind of like the balance thing with the thing where you can train people to get more range or get a deeper squat or open up their hips farther like a 90-90 stretch and all these things. So my trainer basically has me on like elevating my heel off the floor but while standing completely on one leg, right? And we're doing this and then we're doing some squats and then we're just lifting my leg up and he's training all of these like individual movements, right? To where Basically, we go from, I'm not going to elevate my foot onto this platform that I have to see, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to elevate my foot so that I can slide it. And basically, I go onto one leg and I slide and I slide. And my foot is basically doing this, right? It's lifting and sliding. It's lifting and sliding. And I get comfortable with that motion. And before you know it, boom, I can get on that box in 45 minutes, right? Because I set it up to a way where it's like, hey, can you do five of these? Then let's do 10 of these. Let's try five of these and 10 of these. And before you know it, you've done nothing but set yourself up with success after success after success after success. Now you believe in the path because your partner, your partner, your partner, right? The guy that's a professional has now told you that he can do this thing if we can do this. And he's given me these five exercises that I can do today to get me on that box. If you could do these five exercises, he says you can jump on that box. And I said, okay. I do these five exercises, I jump on the box. Now, the question, the question is, did the five exercises actually do something to get me onto that box? Or did he use those five exercises to make me feel Right, make me feel like I can get onto that box. Because did I actually get stronger in 30 minutes to jump onto that box? No. No, I believed I could get onto that box. And what happened, right, we backed this up. What happened was I anticipated that my leg would be normal and jumping onto that box was easy. And I failed because I underperformed thinking I didn't have to give it my all to get on top of that box. And then when I had a fear of actually failing, right? I have doubt. I'm unsure. I don't want to hurt myself. I don't want to set myself back. I don't want to embarrass myself. So what he did was he actually backed up and said, hey, Let's do these things over here where you can build your confidence like you can do this and then we'll go back and we'll jump on the box, right? Boom, you can do that anytime, anytime. It's why, it is why you pay a professional because they understand the progression but also the regression to the techniques in case you can't do something in order to allow you to do something that is beneficial to you, not only physically, but mentally, to get to a point where you can accomplish your goal. That's why professional coaching is important, professional weightlifting is important, professional physical therapy is important, professional 
massage therapist is important. Not the guy down the road that works out of like the random place for nine ninety five to get an hour like Swedish massage. Not that guy. A professional who only makes a living doing sports designated massage therapy. Not the feel good like I'm gonna rub your back, right? Paul, see, check out the chat. Paul's with me. He's got it. He teaches people how to weight lift for a living. Oh. Byron, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me with a comeback. I've I've thought about it. It's it's crossed my mind. Man, every time I every time I watch judo and I see like the 81 kilo division and I'm like, oh, I wreck those guys. That's that's my thought. I just look at it and I go, oh, I wreck them. I think. I think, um, um, I'm not going to talk about it today because it, it, it is partly mental, but it probably deserves its own conversation. Um, because we're, we're actually running like way over time here. But one of the things I kind of want to have a live conversation about that drives me nuts when I talk to athletes and people think I'm crazy when I do this, right? People are like, Travis, you're you're just crazy. You're not normal. And I say, no, I am normal. I just understand what it is I'm doing. And it bothers me. It bothers me so much that I feel like we have to have a conversation where people who, who are trying to do something great, they're, they set, they've set themselves up to accomplish this goal or this thing of, of note, right? But their language, the words, the actual words that come out of their mouth are contradictions to their goal. And I feel like, I feel like if people understood how to speak in such a way, where their words actually build their own confidence while, while taking the people around them, building their confidence, right? There, there's a way of speaking where you can build your confidence within yourself and other people will be more confident in you. But when you speak in such a way that that in subconsciously people around you will feel like you're not there right and i think i think a great example and it happened last night because i i misunderstood what somebody said in chat and then it was clarified and then everything is okay but a kid a kid who's who's a lighter weight basically said i'm 73 kilos dominic rodriguez he's a talented kid said i'm 75 75 kilos he's like you know not working out and i had surgery to me to me as a coach and as somebody that pays attention to the verbiage that people use i see that as somebody that isn't training hard they're not paying attention to their nutrition and they're using excuses to justify the action when in reality, if this is true, what, what has been brought to my attention is he actually grew three or four inches. So he's a kid. He's, he grew up and he put on some extra weight. But the problem, the problem is, is mentally, mentally the language that he is using is like a non-acceptance of who he is as a person and what he can accomplish because had he had just said, hey, I'm almost 73 kilos, like I grew three or four inches and I'm going to the weight room to get bigger, to get stronger, that exudes confidence. That tells me like he has a challenge, he understands the challenge ahead and he's taking it on. But when you when you say it, jokingly or not, right? Jokingly or not, doesn't matter. It was said, which means that somewhere deep down, it's felt. Right? So there's a way of speaking 
where you feel and you exude confidence and people around you will be more confident in you and your abilities, right? So you could speak in such a way around your opponents about certain things where it can make them nervous because they see and hear your confidence, right? So I feel like that's a conversation for another day though. But I want to have that conversation, I think. Maybe not. Not sure. <laughs> if I come back and come to Paris, you'll come and watch. I'm not a fan of Paris. I like Germany. Germany's my event. I like Germany. But hopefully that wasn't too much of a rant for everybody. It was good to see some people in here. I like it. Starting to see some some familiar names. But uh, at that point in time, we're about at the two-hour mark, which means I went way over my limit again. I got to get better at that. Got to get... Sorry, just trying to follow the chat here. A lot of things going on. I got to get better at this timing thing. Or I've got to like script it out so I can get it under an hour so I'm not going crazy over. I feel like I'm wasting everybody's time. Not keeping it to like my hour. I don't know. I don't know. No, I'm all down for live, <laughs> for long streams. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> People want to hear this? I don't know about that. I lack confidence in my timing skills. <laughs> wow, don't let Kalita see that you need a wife thing. She'll... Oh. She's been on me. Yeah, I didn't, I guess for the purposes of this stream, I didn't go into the like knit and gritty like like mantras and like other things. I feel like that stuff is pretty, is pretty like out there and people know about it. Um, right, where like those types of like everyday like Google searches you could find and you could find good ideas. I kind of wanted to throw some things out there that maybe you guys might not have heard or a way of thinking to kind of flip how you look at mental preparation where it's not just like an end all be all because there's not a switch that you can just hit it's like anything you have to learn how to do these things and you have to in order to learn it you have to practice like if you have anxiety about going to tournaments Think about how you would have to practice that in order to get better so that you can learn not to have it. That means you have to enter tournaments and compete. Otherwise, sitting back there trying to solve the problem before the act of doing is never going to work. It never works out that way. Okay? So practice, practice, practice. Talk as long as I want. Undersell and over deliver. I try to do that with my instructionals. Try to always over deliver. <laughs> That's what you took from this? That's what you took from this? So ju just for the people that were there, I, ma I made a statement like way back in like 2013 where I tried to quit and then I was like, ah, F it, I'm done. And then I actually won Germany. The premise to that was this. Right, Because I was struggling to wrap my head around how I was going to make adjustments to the new rules. And then it hit me. It hit me, right? We're going to keep going here. We're going to keep going. You guys are keeping me, keeping me going here. I don't know. Maybe I should just do one without chat. That's how I hit the hour mark because you guys are distracting. Right? Oh. 
But anyways, so it hit me that cheating or not cheating, illegal or not illegal, it is 100% irrelevant if you throw the guy free poem. And that's what I went into Germany with where I was like, I'm just going to do judo the way I know how to do judo. And if they penalize me for it, no problem. Because if I come back out there and I do it again and I throw him for Epone, it doesn't matter that I cheated the time before. Right? I still win. And I went, so screw it. I don't care if I'm down by one Shido, two Shidos, three Shidos. It don't matter to me because I'm going to throw you for Epone. And I'm just going to go for broke. So that's where that came from. How many times a day or a week should an athlete work on mental preparation? Um, um, oh, see, I just want to go back into like the USA Judo rant with that question, with this question. Uh, it, It just leads into that rant. I got to have a third rant on the USA Judo problem where I just talk about, let's not let's not talk about the problems. Let me just give you guys my solution and why I think that way and the numbers and the reasoning behind it and why I think it is the answer for today. Not the whole like, let's just put Judo in all the colleges and figure out how we fill it later just to get the infrastructure up. Like, let me give you my plan for today and how we grow into being in every college and being able to sustain it in an actual business sense where people can get paid and live a healthy lifestyle. I'm going to have that conversation. This kind of makes me want to have it right now. But it's 10.30 at night and I got to be in the gym doing construction at like 6.30, 7 o'clock. But here we go. We're going to answer this one. Now, I would, I would be careful. I would be careful about diving into mental prep work and sports psychology too soon. I understand that I gave you guys a little bit of like guidance on to to some of the things that I used to do. But at the same time, I'm I'm not a professional. And I feel like what worked for me may not work for you. So if you go down the road of doing what Travis said, it may not work and one of the things that is really hard to do and it's not so much with with like the mental prep stuff really but just in general when you want to develop if you don't start early and start right the the act of unlearning to relearn to then get better it's very hard to do right so i would start off slow and just kind of like not necessarily start off with the act of you know, mental preparation work. I would start off with the idea of just trying to be more aware of who you are, your surroundings, and where you're at and where you're trying to go. Like just be more conscious of it and don't think that just showing up and doing things is gonna work. Right? So and then once you're once you're more conscious of it and you have an idea of like where some of your faults are, where some of the things you need to get better at, and not just a blanket like I suffer at tournaments. It can't be like that. There has to be a thing that you are actually trying to work on. You don't want to work on all of mental prep as a whole. You want to work on mental prep in like little blocks and stages that you can get better. And if you're really, really struggling and and the actual idea of just trying to conceptualize it scares you, you got to get a professional. Right, my, my number one thing, and I will preach this till the end of time, hire a professional. I hate, I, I absolutely hate everyone who's a do-it-yourselfer, especially when it comes to like sports, right? We, we all believe that we have to go to high school, we have to like, like it, it kills me it kills me. Paul's going to think this is funny, but it kills me. I used to go to an LA fitness to cut weight because they had a sauna and a treadmill and like an elliptical and it was open to like midnight so I could go after workouts 
to like get that extra sweat in case I was cutting weight. And it would kill me to see the people like trying to lift weights. And I'm like, you have no idea what, like I'm proud that you're trying. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm glad that you are putting forth the effort, but it drives me insane that they think that they can just Google search a workout and that they can do it and it's going to benefit them. It drives me absolutely insane. It insane. When I'm driving, I'm driving in my car, in my car and I'm driving and I go to the lake and I see people running and they're trying to get in shape and they're like 200 pounds their form is awful and it's it drives me insane because people think the act of running is something that just anybody can do. And all they are doing is actually hurting their body because they're running in an improper way which is hindering their joints. Which given the time that they're actually got to make it around that lake which is like three miles, mind you. Six months from now, if they keep that up, they're going to have to actually go to a professional just to get fixed, just to get back to running improperly, just to go back. It's like this never-ending cycle of stupidity that drives me insane, right? I see it with judo players all the time. Like, I know what I'm doing. Really? You do? Because you just got the shit kicked out of you. But you know what you're doing, right? You don't need anybody's help. You're good. Yeah, you, you get better next time, right? Like, idiot. Completely moronic. Like, at least, at least I can say with throughout my career, I always, I always sought out a professional to help me get to the next level. Now, mind you, I might have made some bad choices, but I made a choice with somebody I thought was a professional to help me. Right? I didn't just look back and go, I, I get better. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing and I'll get them next time. Oh, insanity. Einstein's definition at its finest, which is like 80% of American judo players. Now, I will also say this. The one thing I am so proud of myself as an American judo player is having the gojones to actually pick up and leave a place because I did not get the results I desired. Think about that. I had the balls to get up and leave because I did not get the results I desired. I feel like most people feel like they, they have to stay and they watch their careers just like dwindle. I see parents working with their kids and I see their kids super talented and then the parent just hangs on. And then the kid just like, as, as they get older, the skill level rises and the kid struggles and struggles and struggles and struggles. But then they might get a win here and then, then the parents are still in it. And I'm like, you're just dying this slow death. And it's like, it kills me. It absolutely kills me. Like, Seek a professional. Find somebody that can help you. And and praise, praise the people that have gotten you to where you are today that have helped. Right? Don't forget where you came from. But don't be afraid to say, hey man, I want more for my life than what I have right now. I'm going to go over here because I'm not getting it here and I think I can get it over there. So I'm going to go. I'm going to pick up all my stuff. I'm going to pack up all my bags. I'm going to move because my life and what happens in it is super important. And it goes above and beyond. We can still be friends. We can still talk to each other. But it goes above and beyond that. And I think there's not enough of that in American judo. Uh, so seek a professional. Like if you want to get, if you want to like really dive into this like mental thing and all that stuff and you, and it, and you enjoy it, right? Like I told you guys from the beginning. I was struggling. I couldn't figure it out. I thought I knew it. I couldn't figure it out. So what I do? I hired a professional. I hired a professional. What do you want me to do? I'm just giving you guys some of the advice that the professional gave me based on my situation. And I hope it helps you. I really do. 
but I hope you're listening to me where it's, it was advice a professional gave me on my problem. That same professional who is super qualified may not give you the same advice for how you're struggling, right? Because we went in depth in my career. Like I talked about like the Russians I could never beat, had to go to Russia in order to feel confident in order to beat them. And then once I went to Russia and I saw them train, I felt like I was outperforming them in the gym. I felt like I was doing more on the mat. It gave me the confidence in order to step on the mat and beat a Russian. Whereas before I always had this Russians on a pedestal thinking, man, they are so much stronger than us. They are so much better than us. I'm just from America. Like, I don't know how I'm going to beat them. I put them on a pedestal. I went there and I removed the pedestal and then I was able to win. Like, I talked to her about that. And I talked about her, about all my processes, about how I think, how, how I do. And she gave me those answers based on how I process. Okay, so seek a professional. I don't know what else to say. Ignore everything I said and go see a professional, I guess. And stop running or seek a running coach so you can get some proper form so you don't blow out your knees and your hips. That's it for me too. I, I went way over time again. Kalita's going to kill me. I'm surprised she hasn't gotten into chat and told me to come home yet. But anyways, that is it for today. I'm actually signing off now. Thank you to everybody that stuck around and listened to me rant about mental stuff. And some of my struggles as an athlete, some of my successes. Um, yeah. Uh, until next time. Hopefully I get my gym set up so that we can film uh, on Sunday. And we are going to go back over some movements and some hand placements to set up throws. And kind of, you know, give you guys a little bit more knowledge on how I do judo and how I think I could help everybody. Until next time. Oh, on Monday, on Monday, I am going to do rant number three. And I want to actually have the conversation on my solution plan for USA Judo. And I want to put it out there, right? Not because I think people need to hire me to do it, but because I think somebody needs to do it, right? And the only reason why I think I should do it is because I've been in my office since 7.30 and it's almost 11 p.m. and I'm still talking to you guys and I don't even get paid for this. So it's more of just like I have a passion for it and I enjoy it and helping people and coaching people is something that brings me joy. So I like to do it. Um, I think I'm pretty good at it. Some people think I suck at it. Some people think I'm an idiot. And hey, they're entitled to their opinions. But I'll share you. I'll share with you guys an in-depth, super in-depth, like solution plan for USA Judo with actual numbers to go along with it. Okay, so look out for that on Monday. Okay, Monday, eight thirty here. I guarantee you. I guarantee you, it's going to be over two hours. I guarantee it because we got to we got to like lay it out there so that. If USA Judo sees it, they can go. Let's just fall, let's just rewatch his YouTube video like twenty times, and then transcribe it, and then let's just do it. Let's just implement it and go do it, and then we'll just see Judo grow in America. I don't even care if it's me. Don't even care. I just care that Judo in America succeeds because I actually believe in the talented athletes that we have, and I believe that with some help, they could actually, actually, we could actually dominate. And be a powerhouse in the world of judo because I think we have the right athletes. I just think the guidance and the system is broken. That's all. So yeah. Good night.